we were working with access systems and I was with them and, and worked with them to, to set up our own proprietary system. And I really got to know what that system did from a customer's vantage point. And the more that I got to know from the customer's vantage point, the more I started digging in on the other side of things. So as we continued to grow and develop, um, I essentially helped the, the development team automate me out of a job. So <laughs> then I moved over to the IT team as a business analyst. And um, I've been able to utilize the tools of teaching and training, but also breaking down those big complex things into smaller pieces and communicate it both to our developers and to our business. And so I've found a home in IT. That's so great to hear. Um, so Rachel, how did you get into technology? Well, I think it really started when I hooked up my first Nintendo to a TV and I was like, heck yes. And I was very good at it. And I hooked it up to TVs all over my neighborhood of questionable origin. And I trotted that Nintendo all over my neighborhood. And I was like, I really like knowing how things work. And so I ended up doing uh, I thought I was going to work in music, not as a singer because I'm garbage, but I was a DJ through high school and college, and I thought I was going to work in the music industry, and I ended up interning at a local TV station, and I fell in love with it. I loved it. It was all the people were smart. Everything was so fast. I felt like I was in an Aaron Sorkin show in the 90s, um, and so I turned that internship into a part-time job while I finished school, um, a lot like what Lillian's doing here today, and um, when I graduated, they offered me a job in leadership running the uh, web division. And at that moment, that was the, you know, 15 seconds before the iPhone launched and we didn't realize how big mobile news was going to be. Um, so I was in a department head role when the first iPhone came out. And so I got to be on the front lines and set up the first Facebook page and do all of those things. And I always loved technology, but seeing that and seeing the impact zone was amazing once in a lifetime kind of experience to get to have. Um, and I continued to um, be so interested in how things work and follow that career um, and ended up at Circle after working at a public library system in, in marketing and building them an app and building them a new website and revamping their entire digital presence. And um, I bought Circle um, for my library system because I loved automation. And I was with that for about six months and they said, hey, uh, we need our first ever marketing director. Do you want to come do this? And I knew that I would always regret it if I didn't take a chance, despite having like a six-year-old at home and a very stable job. So I jumped on the rocket ship of a startup, um, fastest thing I've ever done in my life. And after about two years, I had fallen in love with the idea. I love writing and I wrote every word in circle of all of the user messages. And I Googled something one night and I discovered there was a job called product where you literally did this for a living, like where you talk to users and you understood the business and you love the technology and you get to work with all these different groups. And I kind of like said it out loud to a colleague. I was like, I think I would like to work in product. And it was like three months later, my boss was like, I love product, but I can't do it anymore. I need to concentrate on something else. Can you do this for us? And it's been the best three years of my career. And so it's just been, it's always been technology and it's always been solving problems. Definitely an interesting start with the Nintendos. Um, Lillian, what about you? Yeah, actually, Rachel, I can kind of uh, relate to a lot of what you're talking about because I'm also in product, but um, it definitely started at a young age for me too. I have three older siblings. They are all engineers. My father is an engineer. Um, and so it it's always been in kind of the back of my mind to get involved in engineering. And then as technology grew, um, it became more and more fascinating. And as Heather mentioned in the chat, I also was part of Interalliance in high school. So that was probably kind of where it started. Uh, luckily for me, my three older brothers also did, were involved in Interalliance. So um, I got my foot in the door there. And that's how I got my first internship at Procter & Gamble, which was an uh, incredible experience, um, especially because, and anyone who has done an Interalliance internship can attest you're not getting coffee or doing grunt work like you are actually doing work that you know college interns or new hires would be doing too. Um, I also attended Girls Who Code my sophomore year of high school between my sophomore and junior year of high school. Um, that's kind of where I really learned how to code and really learned how to um, get in there and understand the code and understand development and understand kind of 
how developers work um, and, and the, that side of the processes. Um, when I came into college, I actually was a computer science major. I did computer science research. I worked in the different tech departments. I worked with the computer science and engineering department here at Ohio State. Um, and through all of those experiences, I actually, and more internships, I, I realized that I don't wanna be a software engineer. <laughs> um, Lauren, I don't know how you do it because I can't, but um, it's just not for me. And so then I switched my major to MIS, which is what I'm in now. Um, I still have my computer science minor, but um, my shift has really been to wanting to work in product because of all of the reasons and more that Rachel mentioned, you know, that we are working with people. We're getting real-time feedback from people. We're trying to understand our customers and make it the best possible experience for them. But we're also trying to make our developers' lives not terrible either, right? We wanna to come to them and say, I understand that this is gonna take you X, Y, Z time. And I understand, um, like, let's help each other so that everything works how it's supposed to. Um, and I think it's incredible to be in a position, especially as somebody who's still in college, um, to be able to make decisions like that and uh, really have a kind of a crazy amount of impact um, on a company in that sense. You've accomplished a lot for being just in college, um, but I know I've learned that technology is not only software development. So what are some common misconceptions that people and women have about the tech industry and how can we combat those mis misconceptions and communicate more effectively? Um, Stacey, would you like to start? Stacey, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, you're right. A lot of people do believe that it has to be heavily uh, coding and engineering, but uh, the truth of the matter is, is that technology is not all about that. Um, there is uh, a, a large need for people who can provide that customer service and, and understand uh, while not maybe not necessarily coding. Um, so I try to make sure that when I see qualities in people um, that I think would be beneficial in product, I try to let them know that. Typically, um, I'll do things like explain my job in the way of construction. So I say, um, at, in a construction site when building a house, you have the customer, you have the contractor who is putting together the the scale model of the house, and then you have the construction workers. Um, technology includes me, who is that contractor. My responsibility is understanding what the customer needs um, and then communicating that to the construction workers. I can't pick up a hammer, but I can totally tell you um, where they want the walls. So um, letting people know that that exists, that that is an important part of technology um, has really opened some doors for people who uh, haven't fallen into it the way that I did. Thank you. Um, Lauren, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I am. Um, those were some really great points, Stacey. I think another, um, another misconception that people have when they're applying for jobs is that, I mean, women in particular, they are very cautious when they're applying for jobs and they want to make sure that they are meeting all of the requirements that are listed. And sometimes, I don't know if you've looked at tech job requirements, sometimes they're nonsensical. Like they'll, they'll want 10 years of experience in a programming language that has only existed for a couple of years, or they want you to be able to know database construction as well as front-end development. And it's finding those people who can do everything is really difficult. And like Stacy said, finding someone who can communicate tech ideas is really hard to find, um, but is super valuable in, in a variety of roles. So I think, you know, there are a couple of misconceptions there with like, you know, you may not think that you fit the stereotypical programmer idea from what you see on TV shows and movies where, you know, there's the nerdy guy who sits in the basement and he just eats pizza all the time and, um, he doesn't do anything except program and those people exist but i think for the most part those people are rarer than than people would expect um 
I think that that's one of the greatest things about tech is that it can be welcoming to such a wide variety of people, with different backgrounds and different roles. You can, I think that there's a role in tech for everyone. And I think that's such an important thing for people, especially women to realize. Um, Rachel, what are some misconceptions you think are in the industry? Yeah, I think that it's a boys club is one. I think that the longer that I'm in technology and the more experienced I become, I realize how much my perspective is valued in the companies that I choose to share my talents with, right? Because um, women use my product uh, mostly, right? And so that experience is valuable. I think that um, that it is the pizza eating basement dwellers. Yeah, but like my engineers love to hike and they love to fish and we talk about gardening, you know, so there's a lot of different um, room for places to grow. And then depending on what your passion is, there's so many different, especially here in Cincinnati, we are Lord blessed with like a lot of Fortune 500 companies plus a lot of startups. So we have a lot of variety of experiences that you can have within the city. Um, so I think that's a common misconception. How do you overcome it? You have more people in the room that look different than you. You have more people in the room um, and you make sure that you make the room inviting to people with different viewpoints because that makes better products. It makes everything better when we have more people, more variety building things. What about you, Lillian? Yeah, I mean, so many amazing things have already been said. Um, I mean, I guess to kind of echo what Rachel is saying, um, I think a lot of times you feel very, very alone or you can feel very alone, but there is a huge network of women in tech out there. Um, and maybe it's within your company, maybe it's not, maybe it's gonna be something completely online. But what I've found is that the network of women in tech is so strong and so empowering and um, more often than not, they are they will always have your back um, which is a really incredible thing um and i think another thing that a lot of people especially younger right now are worried about is that they have to work at facebook amazon apple netflix uh, microsoft google in order to be successful right and i would say that that is completely not true um take it from somebody who worked at google and decided not to go back um you know it's for whatever reason if you want to stay or if you want to leave that's completely your choice and every company doesn't fit every personality and what company you're at doesn't define your level of success and I think that's really hard to wrap your head around a lot of the times when everyone is talking about oh you know I'm working for Google I'm working for Facebook I'm working for Apple so I'm obviously doing better um the the scale has the the scale of comparison is imaginary and it's just something that people talk about um and really at the end of the day it comes down to are you learning um and are you happy in what you're doing um and i think it's it's very hard because not a lot of people will tell you that either. They'll they'll always just kind of try to push you to whatever they think that their definition of success is. Um, and it's it's also hard to try to figure out for yourself what your definition of success is. Yeah, that last point was really good. And a lot of these organizations that are sponsoring this event can actually help you find those networks that you're finding of women. Um, so definitely engage with them. Um, so is there anything that you did earlier in your career that you wish you could go either go back and do differently? Rachel, do you wanna start this one off? Oh my gosh, like 2000 things, are you joking? First of all, it took me in something that I instill when I talk to young people is that you need to remember that people have jobs, like just people, people, fallible, stupid people like you that went to state school or dropped out or did whatever. They're jobs and they do them. They're not miraculous. There are very few miraculous people in this world. The rest of us just do our best in the job we find. And so I wish I would have shot further, not the like that, that whole scene that doesn't ever did anything for me, but like, I wish that I would have known earlier what I was capable of and really embraced my capability when I was younger. Um, and like had no problem catching up later in life, but I wish that I would have seen my potential when I was younger. Um, I 
was very grateful. The thing that I did right was that I found mentors or mentors found me or when they were welcoming, I welcomed them because mentors are invaluable, um, both from a peer perspective and also people who are more experienced than you. And, you know, it was, it probably, I, there's probably decisions that I could have made that would have been better and made things easier. But the end, like, there's so much opportunity if you decide to embrace it. And if you're going towards something you're passionate about, you will probably find success doing it. Having um, empowering women like all of you here can really help you in your career. Um, so what about you, Stacy? So I think um, I've always had the mentality that wherever I am is the best place to be. Otherwise, I wouldn't be there. So whether I was working at Sears or Wendy's or, or wherever, I've always had that mentality. But one thing that I didn't have that I picked up a little later um, is the, the idea of renting or mortgaging on my profession. So when you go in and you just do what is expected of you, you're renting on your profession. You're giving just what is expected of you. But when you go in and you shoot for above and beyond, when you shoot for challenges that are beyond your um, expectation for yourself or, or what you think is your ability, you're investing in yourself professionally. You are doing for yourself something that will you can carry with you elsewhere. Um, and I wish that I had done that more. Um, so recognizing that, sure. Um, I may be looking at um, other companies to find out what their people are doing so that I can do that. Um, but this is for my company in that I'll be able to bring these things to them. But if for whatever reason um, that company isn't there tomorrow, I still have that knowledge. I still have that experience that I expose myself to because I invested in myself. So I wish that I had done that earlier, although I, I caught it quick, but I wish I had caught that earlier. Um, what about you, Lillian? Yeah, um, I feel like I've been in my career for approximately five minutes, but um, <laughs> I would say that I wish, uh, especially through my high school internships, that I wasn't afraid to speak up, um, whether that be asking questions because I didn't understand something that was going on in a meeting or that be saying, hey, I think this would be a great idea. Can we explore that option? Um, it has always been difficult for me and it still is difficult for me to speak up. And it's definitely a learned trait, at least for me, uh, but it's something that is incredibly important. Um, and it's also kind of like a self-advocacy part of it in that it, probably is a boys club whatever room you're gonna walk into and you need to be able to stand up and say you know what I'm thinking feeling whatever question that I'm asking is valid and it's okay to ask and nobody um you know is going to look down at me for asking this question or bringing up this idea because you know it is valid and I think that now as I'm getting into a more prominent role, it's a lot easier for me to do that. And I'm more comfortable doing that. But I definitely wish that earlier in my career, that was something that I um, really worked on. And for me too, like starting as early as high school, I think that's something I would definitely use too. So thank you for that. Um, and then Lauren. Yeah, I think kind of building off of what Lillian said and being able to be confident and speak up when you're in need of something. I think that early on in my career, um, I really wanted to have a job that had a strong mentorship program in place or a strong apprenticeship, um, kind of what we're trying to build at PNG for for people coming into development. Um, it was, I was on my own more than I wanted to be and um, I think if I had had that support and if I had been able to voice that I had that needed that support, then I would have been more successful early on when I kind of um, struggled with a lack of confidence in my ability. 
Um, so we all know that there is an incredible lack of women in technology. So how has that impacted your career? Lillian, would you like to start? Yeah, so um, sometimes it's definitely discouraging. Uh, sometimes walking into a room full of male peers can be very discouraging. And I'm not trying to gloss over that or pretend that doesn't exist because it does. However, just kind of to go back to my other point of when you meet other women in technology, like the amazing women on this panel or anyone who you'll network with or you'll see at conferences or reach out to through LinkedIn, um, when you meet other women in tech, it's very empowering and you really do build a network and a bond. And it's nothing like um, any other professional relationship because you, you know that um, you're both women in tech. You're both, you've seen the same struggles and you kind of know how to deal with them and know how to get through them. And you also know how to lift each other up when you need to. Um, you definitely have to battle things like imposter syndrome um, or only being being the only female in the room. But again, like having that network is, is really strong and something that also is really good to lean on when you need it. Yeah. Um, Rachel, what about you? For me, it's been a net positive, honestly, um, because I feel like I bring a perspective to the rooms that I inhabit. I feel like I'm been welcome. And when I haven't been welcome, um, my presence makes them question why they don't. Um, I'm not above, I'm five foot nine. I'm a big girl. I'm not above putting on big heels to be purposely taller than you if you try to belittle me. Like, don't play with me um, because I don't deserve it. And because I do have something to offer, I do have value. I deserve, I bring value to the company every day. And so um, for me, it's been a while since I've had to say, you don't get to say that to me. It's been a while since I've had to say, I don't like the way you handled that. But, um, and that I think is, is a bit of a privilege too, right? It comes with age, it comes with experience and confidence and all that thing, but it is possible. But, um, and, but I feel like then my job is to say, why aren't there more women here? Why am I the only woman here? And so even in TV, when I was doing that, I was the only woman department head for many, many years, right? Um, and it's not fun to be the one who speaks for all women. And I'm not the Lorax, I don't speak for the trees, right? So I have to um, make sure that I'm making room for more people. But all in all, it has been a net positive for me because I know how to listen, because I know how to talk, because I hear all the things that are happening in the room that nobody's saying. I feel the energy of the people, like I'm reading all those signals that maybe other people haven't been trained or as adept at reading, and I can help bring people together that way. Yes, we definitely need more representation in women in technology. So Lauren, how has, um, how, how has the lack of women in technology impacted your career? Yeah, I can say that, um... <laughs> There's in my first four years as a developer, I was the only woman developer on a team. So I'm pretty used to, or I had gotten used to being, um, being the only woman. And now that's definitely not the case and it's, it's great. But when you are the only woman on a team, I think it's important to be confident. You have to be confident and you have to, you have to assert yourself a little bit more, um, you know, because I mean, I'm kind of a quiet person, so people can kind of steamroll over me sometimes. And being in those environments, you really have to speak up, um, you know, or you, it'll be a bad experience because they're not used to working with women as much. Like I've had managers in the past that were like visibly nervous to speak with me one-on-one -on -one in a coaching situation just because they had never managed a woman before. And I mean, that can be kind of off-putting because you wonder, you know, is there something wrong with me? And there's nothing wrong with me. You, they're, you're just a different type of person that they've never worked with before. And, um, and so getting used to, um, to being confident and kind of putting up with a, a certain level of 
uncomfortableness from other people has been key. Yeah, that's really frustrating and saddening that <laughs> they just haven't uh, managed. But uh, Lillian, what about you? Oh, sorry. Um, did I mean to come up? Yes. Um, Stacy, sorry. Stacy, yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, uh, I, I have become the Lorax, I will be honest. Um, when I see that there aren't women in technology and I see less women of color in technology, I stand up for um, the women who are afraid to speak up. And I uh, feel like it's my responsibility to be that representation um, for women in technology. So I find that I'm constantly um, not only encouraging my teams, um, the women that I work with to speak up, to um, bring things out when they see things um, and to hold the company accountable, but I am the voice when I see that, that other people can't. I feel like um, I really appreciate my, my organization, but you don't make any company, person, anything like that better if you're not giving them feedback. And so sometimes uh, I'm a little loud with the feedback, but it, it helps. Um, I owe it to my company to allow them to improve on the opportunities that they have. So between always being um, encouraging to my coworkers, and the, the women especially to speak up, um, but also for being that voice for them and being that representation for women and even women of color in IT and my organization and wherever else I touch. Um, I really do think I take on kind of that, that Lorax that Rachel is avoiding being. <laughs> um, so with that, um, what are you doing personally to make tech an inclusive space for marginalized people that are in tech now? Um, Lauren, would you like to go? Honestly, at, at this point, I'm I'm not doing enough. Um, I had I had been making a bit, an impact when I was a part of Girl Develop It, um, helping adult women and non-binary individuals um, gain confidence around tech so that they could either pursue a career in tech or um, or just be more comfortable in whatever role that they have. Um, with that being on hiatus for as long as it has been my my efforts have been in on educating myself and trying to speak up in conversations at work where i'm able to um, advocate for getting more women um, into the interview process or changing our interview process so that it can be more inclusive um, you know, this, another thing I, I liked to do before before the pandemic and everything got shut down was I was pretty regular at several of the tech meetups in Cincinnati. And I started consciously doing that when I heard that one of the reasons that women won't sign up to go is because they look at the RSVP list and they don't see anyone that looks like them. So I made it my goal so that there would at least be one woman there that they knew so that hopefully that would remove that barrier and more women would feel comfortable coming to meetups because it's just a it's great to connect with other people in the community and it needs to feel safe and i have so many friends in that community that i feel like i can maybe be a bridge for some people who are trying to get in That's cool to hear. Um, Lillian, what about you? Yes, yeah, so um, in college, it's been uh, interesting because I definitely meet and see people from every demographic, especially university as large as Ohio State. Um, when I was a freshman, I decided to join the Association of Computing and Machinery for Women on campus, which is basically the Women in Computer Science Club. Um, the last two years I've been on their executive board and what I've really tried to do is bring in younger um, individuals. So whether that be working with 4-H on programs to, um, you know, get students more involved in code or whether that be volunteering at, um, 
local schools who can't afford to have a computer science teacher and we can go in and teach workshops on the weekends um, and things like that. Granted, things have changed a little bit because of COVID um, and it's definitely more difficult to do that. But I think that that is probably one of the biggest things. Um, another thing is mentoring the underclassmen. Um, sometimes you just need somebody who's around your age to say you can do it and you can make it to the next week and you can make it through the job interview. And I think it's really encouraging to have somebody um, there for that. And I really, really try to do that because I think mentors are so, so, so important. Um, it was always hard for me to speak up, like I mentioned earlier. And so I actually got involved with a program through Google called hashtag I'm remarkable and it focuses on bringing women as well as basically on any underrepresented group um, in technology just kind of empowering them giving them the voice for them to speak up giving them this space for them to speak out and um, that has been an incredible program that I've brought to Ohio State for the last three years and something that I have talked openly about and am a big part of. And I think that it's really important to not only do your part in empowering others, but also do your part in helping them empower uh, even more people. Yeah, mentoring is such an important thing that people don't realize the impact of. Um, and Rachel, you mentioned that earlier too. So would you like to tell us like what you are doing to make tech an inclusive space? Not nearly enough. I mean, and that's the truth. And I think that you continue to ask this question of me until I do something more for it. Whenever we're hiring, I always make sure that we're including a variety of people from backgrounds, ages, you know, race, class, sex, origin, all of it. I want a variety of applicants. I want the right person for the job. And I want to make sure that we're not putting things like degree requirements on our job postings. So we don't weed out people who would be perfect for the role, but maybe um, you know, didn't finish a four-year degree, like those kind of things, but it's not, what I'm doing is not enough. I do mentor and all those things, and I speak, and I encourage students to consider a career in tech and remember that there's lots of options out there for careers in tech, but there's really no bottom to what we could do. There's, it's all upside from here. And then last but not least, Stacey. So for me, um, I would have to agree with all the ladies. It, the, the more you can do, the better. Um, but one thing that I try to make sure of is that in my organization where I can control kind of what I see and what I do, um, I make it a point to identify limiters and biases that don't um, necessarily uh, come too far from the leadership that we have. Um, one example that I have is um, we had an all hands meeting um, in our organization and um, the CIO um, gave us encouragement to um, prepare ahead of time and to be brief when bringing feedback. And I recognize um, what the, the concept was behind that, but I also recognize that from my vantage point, we as women and even people of color feel as though we need to spend um, more time explaining things and, and getting our point across. So when you hear things like be as brief as possible, you shut down. That's a limiter for certain people. And because I recognize that he can't see things from a woman's vantage point. He can't see things from a person of color's vantage point. Um, and so he may not know. I made it a point to let him know that this is maybe not what he meant and not what he intended, but this is what happened. And it was one of the best experiences I ever had because he was super responsive. He was really receptive to that feedback and even uh, came to our, our most recent one and said, hey, we wanna hear from you. Don't let yourself be limited. And he also gave me the platform to speak to the group about ways to prepare that allows you to get your point across and even uh, create courses for uh, communication, pull together courses for communication to provide that to the team. So just making sure that um, when I see things, rather than saying it doesn't bother me, so I'm not going to say anything, I try to think about the people around me, the people who are afraid to speak up for themselves or the people who feel like they should just take it because they always have. 
Um, and I bring that up because in that instance, the biggest thing I learned was that they care. They just don't know. They don't have the ability to see it from that vantage point. So give them that, give them that opportunity. So we talked about the roles we're playing to make tech an inclusive space, but women still face many invisible barriers in tech and the workplace. So what has been your biggest challenge in the tech field, as well as what invisible barriers do you face and what are you doing to manage or overcome those? Um, so what about you, Rachel, you can start off. I think that I was my own invisible barrier, a belief that I didn't have the right degree or the right pedigree um, to play at this level. I was probably it. Um, and it wasn't anything that anyone was telling me or anything I was receiving externally. It was just the way I felt like I have a radio and television degree. I mean, what do I know about technology? You no, know, but what I didn't consider when that inner saboteur was talking to me is like, you wake up in the middle of the night and think about the new Gmail update. You know, like that's how I've always been. I've always wanted to turn the turtle over and see what was on the other side. Um, so I had to get out of my own way. And I think that that's something that all of us struggle with, um, imposter syndrome. It doesn't matter what stage of your career that you're at, everyone battles a fair amount of imposter syndrome and realizing it, noticing it for what it is. Do you write it down and talk about how you're feeling to yourself? Do you talk to, it, to a mentor or a peer? But you have to find a way to get that grossness out of your, out of your system and be like, no, that's not, that's not the truth of the situation. The truth of the situation is this, and you can do it and you are capable. Um, so I think that's been my biggest barrier. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, I think similar to what Rachel was saying is, you know, imposter syndrome is probably the biggest challenge that I have personally. And, um, I, I know that I didn't need to go back to school and get a degree, but I did because I felt like I needed to have something sturdier to stand on as a woman entering tech. I didn't feel like, like I could make it without that, um, which is, is not true at all. I know a lot of very successful people who didn't get computer science degrees or finish school at all. Um, it really isn't a determining factor in how successful you are in a technical career. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some of it is because the things that I learned in college, at least, were pretty outdated. Um, so the things that I was working on in school was 10 years <laughs> behind the times of what I was actually building when I went to my internship. Um, you know, but I, I felt like I needed that. And I still, I just get discouraged pretty easily when things don't click because um, in school, everything just was easy for me. And uh, programming is not easy. <laughs> um, and it's something that I really struggle with and I have to work hard at it. Um, but it's also a key to not let it paralyze you. And I, I think it's one of the most rewarding things I've, I've done is, is working through when I'm struggling on a, prog on a programming problem. And when I, I don't think that there's any better feeling in the world when I finally figure it out. Um, it just makes you feel unstoppable. And so I encourage everyone to try to work through those barriers when you can. Yes, that feeling is really amazing. Um, <laughs> Stacey, um, what are some invisible barriers you faced? So um, for me, I have battled with um, depression and anxiety and, and bipolar disorder since I was 13. So emotions are a big deal for me, but I'm also extremely passionate. So um, when I speak up, sometimes the barrier is me. I'm afraid that people are going to judge me because I'm speaking up or people are going to think that I'm angry or overly emotional. Um, and a lot of that is self-talk. A lot of that is um, me projecting how I feel about what I have to deal with on other people. So that's always been um, kind of a challenge for me. Uh, I was afraid to reach out for what I wanted out of fear that people would think that I was irrational or um, that I was pushy or, or things like that. Um, and that was really hard for me. I've, le I've since learned that I don't have to worry about the um, emotional woman or angry black woman um, 
fears that that uh, other people have because my intentions are good my purpose is good so even when I mess up what I mean to do is 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 good and I can learn from whatever failures I run into so um, that's kind of how I've overcome it but it's definitely something that I have to battle with and I know that there's a lot of people like me who are unable to say that that's something that they have to battle with so it makes it um, all the more important for me to not only speak up about those battles but also to fight them Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Lillian? Yeah, I can definitely relate to what some of Stacy is referring to. Um, and I'm definitely also the person to be afraid to speak up due to possible, not even real, but possible, um, you know, backlash or what somebody might come back and say. And I mean, I, I have been the person who somebody has said, you're too emotional. Um, actually in college, I had an advisor who told me that I should go into fashion and design because technology wasn't for me. And I said, that's not okay to say. And if I was a man sitting here, you wouldn't have said that. And he came back and said that I was being emotional. And it's people like that and situations like that, that really makes me personally doubt my abilities. And it's, not okay for um, male counterparts, even female counterparts, anyone to say that to you. And it also, it definitely affects you a lot more than them, right? It's, you're going to sit with that and you're gonna say, well, maybe I am not good enough. Maybe I do need to change this. Maybe I do, maybe X, Y, Z, right? And I think my biggest barrier is definitely myself and that, I need to know that, you know, I have worked my butt off and I have fought for every position that I've been in and I deserve to be there. Um, and so it's hard for me to, to recognize that and it's hard for me to move past that. But again, um, leaning on your network, leaning on people who will lift you up is so, so, so important there. You have to remember though, anybody can talk, but you get to decide who to listen to. That's the power you have. Whose opinion matters to you becomes a lot more clear the longer that you live. And the opinions like that do not matter to you. They do not serve you. Mm -mm. No, thank you. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings is other people's opinions of you are none of your business. Let them have them, but it's none of your business. Yes, like Stacy said, that is so unaccept unacceptable. And so we talked a lot about like networking and mentors, but we want to know, have you been through a formalized mentorship program or an outside mentor throughout your career in tech? Stacy? Yeah, so I'm really big on mentorship programs and things like that. Um, I've been, my company provides a mentorship program for their IT teams, and I've gotten an opportunity to have three separate uh, mentors, and each of them has granted me something different every single time. Um, but one thing that I try to keep in the forefront of my mind is that uh, women are over mentored and under sponsored. So I like to make sure that with any mentor that I take on, um, that they know that I'm looking for sponsorship as much as guidance and support. I'm also looking for sponsorship, which has really worked out for me. Um, I just accepted a position as finance manager um, at my company. And the reason that my name was uh, out there, other than the fact that I worked my butt off, um, was that one of my mentors actually said to the person looking for someone for that position, hey, go, go, go talk to Stacy." So um, having that sponsorship is huge. Yes, I want your feedback and I want your guidance, but I also want you to champion me when um, opportunities open up. Congratulations on that. Um, so Lillian, um, are there any mentorship programs you've been through? Yeah, so I've done both formal and informal mentorship programs. Um, and I've right now have mentees as well as am a mentee. And I think it's really important to be both and have both. Um, and it's also really important 
to connect people, right? So I think a biggest part of my mentorship is, you know, I'll meet somebody, we'll um, get along, I'll learn so much from them. And then I'll say, hey, you know, I know this person who's going into your field who I'm pretty sure would love to learn more. Um, would you be okay to chat with them? And then, you know, you create that next connection and you're helping build somebody else, somebody else's network. And so I think that that's a really important part of informal mentorship that can come from a formal mentorship program. Yes. Um, Rachel? Yeah, I had a formal mentorship program year long, you know, thing when I was in TV and it was pretty stiff and I, and I came away with it with a lot of information about business and a lot of like businessy type stuff, but there wasn't really an emotional mentorship. I've been blessed with two distinct mentors in my career that were both women. Um, neither one of them are in technology, but what they are, are experience and understanding about the challenges that I would face uh, from a personality perspective, from being a mother, um, from the where I want to end up, um, from a leadership perspective. And so they weren't technology mentors per se, they were just career mentors. And they both offered me and continue to offer me very different things, which are two things that I need so badly. And like seeing what your mentors give is really cool. I love being a mentor. Um, I like temporary mentoring and long-term mentoring. I love all of it. I love sponsoring and boosting up women, letting them know when they're, hey, you need to get your name in for that. Hey, what are you doing today to make your grind better? What are you doing for your career next year? What are you going to ask, tell yourself you wish you would have done a year from now that you could start today? Um, just all of those things, I'm always looking for opportunities to help boost people up into the people that they can be. I think there's enough room in the sun for all of us. So being a mentor and getting mentored are both equally important. Um, Lauren? Yeah, I think I had mentioned before that I had wished that I had had access to a mentor early on. Um, so I've never been in a formalized mentorship relationship with anyone. Um, I have mentored other people, and I think that that is a really great way to grow as a developer myself because I get to share my knowledge and encourage other people. And I'm really passionate that I was able to um, kind of kind of turn my life around by discovering tech later. Um, and I love to encourage other people that that is possible and you can do the same thing. Um, I think I've had a hard time reaching out to potential mentors. I've been fortunate in, in my current role that I have um, some really great male coworkers that I, I feel like I can talk to about anything. And that I've <laughs> mentioned before, that has not always been the case. Um, it's hard to, I mean, as a woman, I was like, brought up and my mom was always like be very careful about um spending time with other guys be careful how you present yourself with other men and so like reaching out to someone who I briefly met at a meetup to see if they wanted to get coffee and tell me more about what they're working on is something that I haven't been comfortable doing and I haven't really run into any kind of any women technologists in the wild that um that I would be able to do that with but I'm, I'm always happy to meet with people. I love to hear what people are working on and I love to help other people if anybody wants to have a Zoom call with me later. <laughs> you definitely learn a lot with that process of mentoring itself too. Um, so tech moves really quickly and it can be overwhelming. So what do you do to promote continuous growth and not stagnate into your career in the long term? And with that, also in the short term, are there any tools you use for continuous learning? Um, and then we can start off with Lillian. Yeah, so um, there are, first of all, there are so many courses online right now. Um, and a lot of them are free, some of them are not, but they are incredible resources to get your foot in the door somewhere. Uh, you don't necessarily need to take an online course and be, you know, a software engineer, right? But get your foot in the door, uh, learn something new. And that's definitely something that I uh, try to do in my free time. 
There are also tons of books. Uh, I don't know who all is a reader or not, but um, there are tons and tons of books about the, out there about leadership, about technology, about the changing technology and things like that. Um, I have a whole list that I've gotten about a quarter of the way through, but um, I have a whole list that I've gotten recommendations from different mentors or different people in my company who have loved them. Um, another uh, platform that's very new and I'm not sure how many people know about it is Clubhouse. Uh, it's a, I have a very love hate relationship with it. I don't know about anyone else, but it's an incredible platform where it's similar to podcasts and there are different rooms that creators or leaders can, uh, create and you can sit in on them and then raise your hand and ask questions. So for example, the other day I was in a room with the CEO of Netflix and the CEO of Stack Overflow. Um, and they were literally just taking questions from the audience, right? And I didn't necessarily have a question on the topic, but sitting in there listening to how they think, how they work, you know, how they solve a problem um, helps me to learn, you know, maybe I'm not looking at all the sides of a problem. Maybe I need to ask more people. Maybe I need to ask more questions. And um, maybe I need to, you know, pull in different perspectives, right? And so I think finding the place that's best for you to absorb new information and keep learning and keep asking questions is so, so, so important. That's so cool. I'll definitely check Clubhouse out. Um, Lauren? Yeah, I also leverage social media a, a lot. Um, I think we're in a really great time right now. I, I know you, you talk to some of the um, more experienced developers and you know, they'll tell you about well, when they got interested in technology, they went and bought a book about programming and, and those books still exist and they do make great resources, but also they become out of date really quickly. Um, so I follow a lot of like core contributors to programming languages and creators of frameworks and people who create online courses um, on Twitter. That way they are it's coming straight from the source of the people who are working on developing these technologies and they're available to answer your questions, which is really cool. Um, but they're all pretty friendly people, um, which you might not have guessed just by, you, you hear of someone and you're like, wow, this is this really impressive smart person who created this technology that we all use, but they're inaccessible and that's just not true anymore. Um, I'm also, really lucky that I work on a great team that encourages growth. Um, we have a company book club where we read books on uh, business or technology or management styles. Um, people will share articles with each other and link to courses. Online courses are probably a big way that I, that I stay up to date when I'm interested in something new or I wanna expand my knowledge on a technology that I'm currently working with. Um, as far as front end courses go, Wes Boss is really good, and I've bought several of his courses. Um, also, Emma Boston, who I found on Twitter, um, and they both also have podcasts that are really good where they discuss new technologies, and they have a lot of guests come on, um, and that's been really helpful to hear conversation about it as well. Um, also, anything that you're interested in, there are online courses for it, like not just on um, Udemy or Cloud Academy, but there are specific courses. Like if you wanted to learn mobile development, which I'm working on right now, you can get a membership to raywinderlich.com. And he has a lot of tutorials on there for iOS and Android. And if you wanted to learn cloud, I, there's a cloud guru, which helped me get AWS certified. Um, there are just ton, tons of resources online. Yeah, leveraging these technologies like podcasts and online courses are really good to check out. Stacey, what are you doing to promote continuous growth and what tools are you using? So um, I found a way to cheat the system a while ago that I really like. Um, I typically go to like uh, Glassdoor and Indeed and LinkedIn and look at job descriptions and identify the things that I'm good at, but also um, look at the things that I'm not. And then those are the things that I go and research. Um, 
collecting certifications on things that may not necessarily be beneficial to me right away, but will be beneficial to me maybe in the future that, you know, that investing. Um, and then I'm also always looking for seminars and podcasts and things like that. Um, one thing uh, that was interesting is um, one of the seminars that I went to, the, the, the head speaker um, was really interesting. He was a really cool product guy. Um, I shot him an email after and said, hey, are you coaching or, or anything like that? And he's actually become a great mentor for me. Um, I don't know that I would have done it outside of the Zoom and Teams um, age, um, just because I, I I have that social anxiety and that same fear that that Lauren mentioned, but um, I did find great success in reaching out to someone from those panels. So when they put their information up, like really go and and connect with them. LinkedIn makes that really easy. Email does as well. So um, just continuing to look for different areas to um, learn new things and um, always checking checking out job descriptions for different companies. Rachel, what about you? Yeah, one thing that wasn't mentioned, I subscribe to some newsletters that I get um, like TechCrunch and Product Hunt, um, also industry news, also competitor uh, news as well. And then I, because product is so many different disciplines, I also sprinkle in TED Talks about leadership or business or empathy. Um, so I try to do one of those that I have on a playlist. I do those every Friday. And through uh, Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County, we have free Linda. So you can take any Linda course with your library card. And so um, those courses, of course, can go as certifications to your LinkedIn. And so I've been doing one of those a week for the last few weeks. Um, they're about an hour a piece. And then finally, like I love to read and I'm a reader, so I have to discipline myself and I read a fiction book and then a nonfiction book. Um, so I just finished my nonfiction book. Now I get to dive into my fiction book and I go back and forth between those two ideas all the time. Um, and my nonfiction book can be anything, but most of the time it's about business or it's about uh, startups or it's about product or user experience or uh, sprints something like that. So I always have a list of the things that I hear about and read about in previously mentioned newsletters or things that other people in product have talked about. Yes, TED Talks are one of my favorite things. Um, so my next question is, how has the tech field changed from the time you started until now? Lauren, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, so I've, I've been in tech about uh, seven years now. And from a technological standpoint, coming from a, a front end developer, I can say that I think that the that front end development has become a little more complicated than it used to be. I um, well, I got my first job with HTML and CSS, and now the front end is um, mostly built with JavaScript. Almost every website needs JavaScript now, so that's that's a whole new thing that's a, that makes it a little bit more complicated um you know but it, you also need more things in order to make your website successful now or at least I'm aware of more things that you need to make a, a successful website um so like when you're when you're building you have to take into account performance which is like how big your file sizes are and how big your images are that will affect how quickly your site loads not only will that prevent people from being able to access your site, but it will also, Google will penalize you for having a website too slow and it will affect your SEO rankings, um, which working for PNG brands is obviously very important. So we have to keep in mind um, performance and SEO because we, we want to rank well, but there's also accessibility. And accessibility is, is making sure that screen readers and other assistive tools will work so that literally anyone should be able to access your website. And if they can't access your website, you know, there's the potential for being sued. I don't, if you Google it, there are several companies who have been sued for not having websites that are accessible enough. And, and so you, when you're building front end, you have to take all of these things into account. And I think that there are Maybe they existed before, but I think they're becoming more and more important. Um, coming from a non-technological standpoint, I think that 
kind of hand in hand with needing our websites to be accessible to everyone, that tech is also becoming more available to everyone um, to work in. And people who work in toxic places aren't staying silent about it anymore. So companies either have to address those injustices or or they, people won't apply to work there as much, you know, like you want your company to be deemed a place that is safe and where people can come in and feel empowered to contribute without feeling like there will be ramifications just for being who they are. Um, you know, and another big thing is that companies are removing college degrees as a requirement, which opens the door to everyone who either couldn't go to college or couldn't succeed in that kind of environment because college isn't for everyone, but that doesn't mean that you should be excluded from having a really good job. Accessibility is really important in technology now. Rachel, um, how has the field changed since you started? So it was 15 years ago. Um, so it's changed a lot, right? Just like you were mentioning, like um, the technology has changed. And I think for me, working specifically on the user side of things, I think the um, expectations of the user have drastically changed. Um, where I, I work in a business facing application, a B2B application. And so when I began using B2B tools, like you could have the world's worst DOS looking interface. It looked like it was 1997 and everyone accepted that. It was like, oh, that's fine. That's a business application. It can be ugly. But now, you know, consumers and specifically people using applications like mine are expecting at minimum the beauty that they experience every day with their iPhones, right? So we have to, our technology has become more for people, which is really exciting for me because I love making things for people. Um, I didn't want to make things for computers. So I think that it's become better and I think that it's become quicker and I think it's more exciting because we're really beginning to unlock what's um, capable and available with it. And I think that we're only really at the beginning of how it can help people's lives be better, right? So we're we're getting to the business part, like, yeah, we can make money, sure, 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 that's great. Um, but the next phase of it, I think is really exciting, like what you're seeing with everyone talking about all the online courses, like that part of the education ideal of the internet, like we're just beginning to tap into all the things that are possible. Um, and of course, you know, Dove phones, right? So nobody really had internet in their pocket when I started. Um, and my first like smartphone was a BlackBerry Curve and I legitimately remember being in a bar and people were like, can I touch it? You can get email on that? That's amazing. Like it was like, it was goop and gag everywhere. Um, and now the world is so much different. And I think all in all what that has given us is more people accessing technology, which I think is better and um, getting technology places that it wasn't going to be if what was required was digging the cable company, digging a wire all the way to your house out in the middle of nowhere. Like then these people were never going to get on the internet. So we've really accelerated um, the technology. And like Rachel said, we're just beginning to tap into the power of technology. And so we talked about how technology has changed, but how do you predict technology will be five to 10 years from now? Lillian? Yeah, I mean, I think Rachel kind of touched on how exponentially it has grown in the past. I think it's just going to continue exponentially growing and changing and accelerating and innovating in the future. Um, I think it's a incredible opportunity the next five to 10 years that we have because we are just breaking the surface of what can be done with technology and all the incredible ways it can help. Um, I think accessibility in particular has been um, addressed in the past probably year or last five years more than in the past. And I hope and I believe that it will be continuing to be at the forefront of people's minds when they're developing and, and things are changing in the future. And I think that that is a great thing. And um, I really hope that it does continue that way. Um, I also hope that there are gonna be a lot more women in the space. And I think that's something that we are seeing and um, it is exciting. It's very exciting. It definitely is. And Stacy. Um, yeah, what I think um, I'm seeing more now than, than before and what I think will continue to grow is the interest in STEM programs. 
um, at younger ages. Uh, it wasn't something, I mean, we had a computer class when I was in high school, um, but STEM classes exist now. My son um, has been offered STEM courses in middle school. And so I think as we continue to um, grow those courses at very young ages, we're going to populate the industry a lot more. Um, I think in general, while there are uh, lots of us, the, the market is actually pretty thin. So um, definitely starting at an earlier age and getting more people engaged in um, those technology and um, engineering uh, backgrounds and, and things like that will increase exposure. So I think that'll be a great thing, which will lead to more women and, and more people of color um, in, in these industries. I also think that as we move to actually being agile, I can't tell you how many times I've done interviews where people are like, we're like agile with a lowercase a. But as we move to actually being agile, I think the growth in technology is gonna be um, so much more fast. And that's exciting um, because you're right, we've only tapped the surface of what can be done. So um, when we get more agile about it, when we, when we stop trying to define what's gonna happen and we make things happen and then grow and adjust to that feedback loop, I think we're just gonna see so many things change and evolve um, in, in the world of technology. I know we're nearing the end of our time here. So my last question is, what advice would you give your younger self or someone looking to engage in technology? Lauren, do you want to start us off? Sure. If I can figure out how to work the mute. <laughs> um, I, I think I've, I've said this before, but, uh, you know, I, I wish that I would have known how, what it could mean to work in tech outside of um, my high school's IT program. And the, the teacher told me that, you know, I should, I should go to college and I should work in tech. And, um, you know, to me at the time working in tech meant assembling computers because that's what we had learned in the program. And while that is a good career for some people, that wasn't something that I was interested in. So I blew my teacher off at the time. Um, I also didn't go to college right out of high school because I had no idea the opportunities that were really out there. And I think that I, I think that it's worth knowing what the career options are, even though they change over time. And some careers that exist now didn't exist when I was in high school. Um, I, I think that students should have the opportunity to, to explore different facets of what it means to work in tech before they rule it out entirely. Um, because I, I do think that, you know, maybe people say anybody could be a programmer and maybe that's not for everyone, but I really think that depending on what your interests are and what your strengths are, there is a place in tech for everyone. They just have to know that those places exist and they have to be welcomed into those places. Stacy. I think I would tell my, my younger self to just do it. Um, there is uh, nothing more rewarding um, than being a catalyst for and, an, and a part of the change. So um, being in technology has given me a chance to see and make some revolutions that I would not um, have been able to do if I hadn't started. Um, so I think I would have loved to have started earlier, although um, even as unconventional as it is, I love the path that I've taken. Um, if my 14 year old self was thinking about tech, I would just like really encourage her to do it. Lillian, what advice would you give? Um, I'd say invest in yourself. Um, so whether that be networking or uh, going out for internships or reaching out to people, trying new things, um, right now you're building your brand and you have the opportunity to make it whatever you want so invest in yourself whether you know whether that looks like going to a four-year college whether that looks like going to a software engineering boot camp whatever that looks like to you invest in yourself and um, make sure that you're doing it doing what you love and continually learning um, as somebody who is very young in my career, 
I think some of the best advice that I've gotten is, you know, if I'm unsure about going out for a job interview or doing some opportunity and somebody has said, go for it, why not, right? The worst that's going to happen is that you're going to stay where you are, right? Nothing bad is going to happen from you trying and putting yourself out there and going out for an interview or, you know, helping somebody else do a mock interview. Um, so invest in yourself, um, help others along the way if you can. And, you know, every little setback you can look at as a way to grow and continue and develop. Just do it, go for it, keep growing. I've heard a lot of great advice so far. So lastly, we have Rachel. Oh my goodness, I, wow. Okay, um, so advice to my younger self. I guess it would have been to invent Facebook as Naomi and Mark Zuckerberg, I have to deal with it for the rest of my life that we're nearly the same age. But um, I think that I'm with Stacy, right? It was a very securitist route that got me here. But I think that from every career that I've had, I've brought with me um, different knowledge and different information. I'm talking like, you know, working the drive through at McDonald's, like I learned speed and I learned how to make people work for me and how things process, like all, every, every experience that you have, you bring to the next job, you roll it up in your bag and you take it with you. And so to get the most out of whatever experience you're having and to be present at whatever you decide. Um, and know, once again, that nothing is permanent, right? And that that's good and bad, but take the good way, which is like, try some things out. If you don't like it, things are far more flexible than you can ever possibly imagine that they are. No decision is permanent. Know where you move or decide to work or marry or whatever you decide to do. Nothing is as permanent as you, as you think it might be. So be flexible, be present in your life and listen to opportunity when it comes. You know, learn to recognize the sound of opportunity. You definitely do learn a lot from every experience. You're creating your very own butterfly effect. I'll definitely be using a lot of that advice. I've learned so much from these amazing women here. Thank you so much for your time. And everyone else, thank you for joining us. I'll hand it off to you now, Sierra. Wow, that was great. Uh, first, Ayushi, it was so great having you as a moderator and being able to just like sit back and watch a panel <laughs> that we're hosting for Women Who Cut Cincinnati and not be the moderator and constantly thinking about what I'm gonna say next. So I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for dedicating this hour and a half to be with us and for all our panelists, such great advice, such good takeaways. Rachel, I still can't set up a TV so that you could do that <laughs> much younger. I still haven't figured it out. Lauren, I love that you said a role for everyone in tech. It's so true. Um, Lillian, you made my developer heart warm when he said that as a product manager you want to make life good for your consumers and your developers so important and Stacey I appreciate you so much as a Lorax <laughs> fantastic job everyone um thank you so much for being here for all our guests thank you so much for hanging out with us for the last hour and a half I hope that you took away as much as I took away um, from Women Who Code Cincinnati, Get With It, and Reliance. We appreciate you all so much and hope to see you at future events. Have a great night, everyone.